Okay, uh, good morning. Um, I would like to make an announcement uh, first before I start my lecture. Um, so we have been doing uh, office hour Thursday afternoon around 2.10 to 4.50 technically. Um, I, I, I found that has been uh, fully utilized. The student come here, it's really a lot of good question, a lot of good discussions, not just between me and you, but also amount yourself. You're actually helping each other solving problems. So I'd like to make a little bit more off the sour. So what I plan to do, I think I don't want to do Tuesday because Tuesday, Thursday, if you conflict, you can you conflict everywhere. So I'm going to do Monday lecture after the Monday lecture. I'm actually just going back to the lab. So I'm going to do office hour between after Monday's lecture and before discussion, which is between 10 to 2. It's probably by the time we walk back there, it's already like a 10.20 or 10.30. And then we'll be there until like 1.40. So that gave us time to walk to discussion. Okay, so so I, I thought that that give extra few hours for you guys and for myself to interact with you, we will be able to address more of the challenges that you're dealing with, okay? So starting next Monday. So after Monday's class, we're still doing office hour after class. Each of the class still outside that uh, stone bench, which I don't feel terribly comfortable with all the networking issue. But um, I feel that uh, um, it's, it's, it's nice that we actually go back to academic search as uh, maybe 15 chairs and people can, um, can learn a few hours. I know you have conflict, some of you, I'm sorry about that, but hopefully between these two office hours, we can cover more people, all right? Um, so Monday, uh, let's say 10.30 to 1.30. Maybe that's sorry, yeah, 10 30 a.m. 1 30 a.m. Uh, on Monday. All right. So um, some of you might know that I, I actually supposed to receive my Raspberry Pi uh, today. But I actually I got it last night. Uh, pretty exciting. And then so I start to do like this kind of assembly. And then I, I start to running everything. And that's, that's what I got. I put everything together. This is a seven inch touch screen with Raspberry Pi uh, 4, about four gigabyte of memory. And uh, unfortunately, this is a Linux system. It's not Ubuntu. This is, I think, the default in uh, Raspberry Pi is uh, Debian uh, Linux. But actually, I haven't got the, uh, all the RPC. Uh, C++ installed, but uh, it looks like it should be no problem. I can, I can actually do all work on having server on this one. But the, the, the problem with this, this is a small device with a case here, uh, with a touch screen, it doesn't have a battery. So I have to attach to that all the time. Okay, I will give you more update about what's going on here in a moment. Okay, so, here is, I'm going to start motivate you this way. You can see I'm actually running a virtual machine. This is a virtual machine, a uh, uh, Raspberry Pi virtual machine. Just, just show off a little bit, but you will see that why I'm looking at this later in this semester. Okay, so I'm actually going to uh, discuss a little bit about some of our frustration up to this point about doing homework is VPN is networking. I mean, how many times we have trouble? It's not because your program is not working or you don't understand the problem. It's just networking kind of disable us to do a lot of things. So um, 
because since homework one, we rely on a reliable internet with a lots of firewall in between, and we'll still be able to get to that. I mean, just how many times um, this happened typically in Thursday afternoon that we have discussion, we spend lots of time trying to figure out what's going on. And eventually we realize, oh, you're on a different VPN. By the way, UC Davis, I'm aware of, well, I'm using at least three different VPN. And one particular VPN will work when it's our homework and the other two won't. So you have to use the library VPN. So it's, it's kind of our life, your academic life and real life depend a lot on the networking. So homework three, we talk about a client object need to talk about a server object. And the thing is that how is RPC going to work if we don't have a reliable uh, networking? That's why I actually, homework three, I want you to do client server on your machine because that get rid of already 99% of the challenge we might have. You think about if I put server on Cyrus and then you try to use client to talk to that, uh, there will be a lot of non-trivial problems happening over there. Okay, so what does that motivate us to talk my next subject? So if my client program is in one side of the world and the object I try to connect to is at the other corner of the world, then I rely on whatever a reliable network connection between these two worlds so I will be able to communicate doing something like remote procedure call, as you remember. Well, I have today, I'm going to tell you an alternative approach to look at this, this issue. I will call it, use the term mobile object. Mobile object means that I actually, instead of for me to have a client and the server separate your homework two, essentially homework three is split your homework two into two different places. And then yet you have to rely on internet to connect. So what I'm going to do is that, well, why not just put the client together with the server? So I actually move back my client object to the server and maybe both of them have to move to the same place. That's okay. And then at that particular place, you're going to do local interaction. So in reality, that this is actually very useful, especially when internet is unstable or internet is actually highly demanded. And how do you actually handle that issue? And how do we actually handle that in an object-oriented uh, programming world? So essentially we'll talk about object mobility, it means that whether this object has to be running on your computer at this time, can we actually move this object to the place, like I want to do that with that uh, Raspberry Pi I just show you. And I told you it doesn't have a memory, oh, sorry, it doesn't have a battery. And in fact, it doesn't, it might not have all the way internet connection as well. And the thing is that I want that to work, even though it's unrich to all of us. So how do I, for example, I can do two things. One is I move my object into that device. I did mobile object move into that small device, or I actually move the object out of that device and running on a more stable uh, storage or cloud space. You think about, um, you probably heard about the concept of cloud computing. Uh, cloud computing essentially is outsourcing your hardware platform to a managed infrastructure, and then you just run it over there. And in cloud computing, you can think about, you have so many different, what we call rack of computer. I mean, just give an example, a typical organization where they offer a cloud computing such as Amazon, such as Google Cloud or Microsoft. Uh, those are the three biggest ones I'm aware of. By the way, they pretty much all use some sort of VMware. And essentially what they're doing is that they're having a rack from probably one or two in Asia, one and two in uh, Europe, and US probably have four or five, and the rest of the continent probably has one, and they rely on internet connection, whatever you want to access, they will find the closest one to actually run that. So you can think about that involve a lot of moving parts. When I say moving parts, I'm not talking about moving 
uh, hardware parts. I'm going to talk about moving software parts. That's another concept of mobile computing or mobile object. You're actually moving some of your resources, information resources around the globe and such that you can actually get the best out of that. So that's why the, the internet, uh, some of the service is really reliable. Even the internet itself is not reliable. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there was a major uh, optic fiber cut in, uh, I think in Japan, outside of Japan. It was a really, by accident, it was cut. When it was cut, essentially the communication be between uh, United States and Asia got heavily affected because that is essentially a major pipe. But the internet is robust, so they find the other way to do that, but still much, much slower because the major pipe is gone. Um, that, that is essentially at that time, you want to move your resources to, if you belong to Asia, you want to move your resources to Asia because it's going to be really slow when you try to access resources in the United States and vice versa. If you're in US, you have some access in Asia, you want to use that limited bandwidth to move it closer to you so you have a better interaction. So this is actually called mobility. Um, I should have probably tell you a little bit. Um, this, is a, this is in United States. United States internet is actually across the Mississippi River. There are four bridges that connect East Coast with West Coast. So they have, a, at least the last time I heard, maybe they build more uh, fiber optics around that uh, between different sides of the US. So the thing is, it's the same thing. If that fiber optics got affected somehow, um, the East Coast, West Coast will have problems to communicate with each other and we'll have a solar bandwidth and then we have to move things as well. Okay, so that, that's kind of, scenario to tell you that my next subject is called mobile objects. How do I actually move an object from one place to the other seamlessly without any trouble? And how do I actually using that as a programming concept to uh, achieve that? So now I'm going to introduce my friend. It's called JSON. So the way to work is essentially this is a two two way street. One is called C++ object, one is called JSON object. So up to this point, homework one, two, three, you can see that JSON is a concept. I'm actually going to talk about JSON programming today. Um, but JSON is a really um, general and useful uh, concept in representing any kind of object. And the thing is that for homework five, which I just released, I'm actually going to uh, ask you to develop a program called DumpJ. So DumpJ is actually, how do you actually do from the C++ to JSON side? Actually, this, this slide needs to be modified. So now I actually already changed this to JDUM. The name has already uh, changed differently. This is called DumpJ and JDUM. Now I'm happy. So essentially this is a two part of the world that I can, if the screen will show up. Okay, thank you. So if you have a C++ object, what dump J is doing is that it will dump the C++ object into a JSON format. So essentially you have equivalent of JSON world object that's corresponding to your active C++ object, including its value, the attribute and value, everything, whatever is the state of the, of the object. That's what we call dump. So when we say dump, we means we want to dump the current state of a software system. So this is called dump J, means you dump into a JSON format. And that's homework five. And homework six, I haven't released, but I can just give you a preview, is essentially covered the other way. 
means that I'm actually giving you a result of a dump J, which is a Java, oh, sorry, not Java, JSON representation of a C++ object that it will be able to call that function called JDump, and then it will convert it back to a C++ object for you to use. So if you have this two-way tree, then essentially we remove the boundary between two different worlds of object-oriented system. And as you know, JSON is actually very useful. If I can actually have your object, say, for example, I have a C++ object on that Raspberry Pi device sitting here, and I want to actually take it out because I know uh, at the end of class, I'm going to unplug that power and it will be gone. And so what happened is that I will run the program called thumbj and generate a JSON. And when I get a JSON, then I can actually retrieve that JSON and put it in anywhere I want the C++ object to uh, revive and then to run, continue my service. And, and then I will move it, say, to this computer. And then I'm going to use JDOM. JDOM means that I'm actually taking that JSON and convert it back to C++ object. And I can continue my operation. So this actually um, is the main subject I'm going to cover. By the way, this has a lot of usage, uh, usage uh, beyond just doing mobility. The other main purpose of this um, um, facility is actually provide you another concept of persistent object. So what is a persistent object? So far, all your program, what you're doing is what we call transient object. Transient object means that once you turn off the program, once you turn off the power, the object is gone. Means that next time you actually enter the system, you need to basically restart everything again. I mean, the object may be the same, but the value, for example, you have an object keep tracking how um, a Facebook user are interact with each other and how many millions of likes or how many uh, hundreds of thousands of comments are being made. And those things are gone if they are not persistent. So we need to actually have something called persistent object. How do I keep it persistent? Using dump J. You have object is running, accumulating 10,000 uh, Facebook comments. Well, let's say 10,000 comments from the, the uh, ECF36B students, and you're about to turn off that device. What should I do? I actually turn it into a JSON. Whenever I turn it into JSON, I transport it or store it in my hard disk. That become a file, that JSON is a file. And that file, later I use JDOM. When I want to run the program again, I actually convert it back to a real object. And then I can actually continue because that object is not just, the object as a structure, the object as a content, everything. So, so typically is, is uh, for example, the, the the, we, we talk about the discussion about 10,000 comments. And essentially what you do is you can have a huge JSON that represent a cluster of all those 10,000 comments. That's what we're talking about. Okay, so this gives you a concept about what I'm trying to gear into. It's not just about the lecture to talk about uh, how you can use object programming, but also uh, mostly give you a setup for what kind of things we're going to do in over five, six, and seven, in fact, and eight, actually. Okay, so um, any question before I go into this topic? When there is no question, that could be either a good news, which I explained everything so clearly, or it could be the other extreme, okay? All right, you know what I'm talking about. So uh, any, any, any confusion what I'm talking about? All right, don't worry. If you have a question, if you completely get lost, when I assign you the homework, I will know, okay? <laughs> yes. Five, homework five. Homework four is uh, to ask you to print the 
um, the difference between multiple inheritance and uh, um, a virtual inheritance. Yeah. So basically, right. Homework four is turning C plus plus to to uh, uh, JSON to a JSON file, and homework five is reverse the process, reading a JSON file and turn back into a C++ file. Yeah. So, so homework four, homework five, oh, sorry, homework five, homework six, sorry. <laughs> homework five is, you see, I, I keep confused, even now, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> homework five is actually converting uh, C++ to JSON. Homework six is converting JSON back to C++. Yeah, they're, they're relatively, I think homework five is more challenging <laughs> because once you, you know how to do that writing how do you write json class and code in c++ uh, essentially using json cpp like yeah. yeah um yeah okay any other question okay so i'm going to switch my <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to start to talk about uh, JSON C++ processing. This is um, um, the, the core for homework assignment number five. Um, over here, oh, sorry, yeah, that's good. So over here, we're actually going to cover a few things. We're actually cover two topics. So we move very fast to path through the first four chapter 11 12 13 14 that's the major uh object paradigm so in this lecture this one and next one probably we're going to cover json c++ library to use a, a very nice library for us to handle very useful information and also we're going to start covering chapter 15 because you're going to see that during the processing there's a lot of exception I mean, part of the reason uh, my server for homework two, homework one is not so reliable is because it didn't handle the exception very well. It didn't it's use C, it doesn't use the C++ uh, exceptional handling capability to do a bunch of things. But when you move to homework five and beyond, we're going to use a lot of exceptional handling. So this is handle runtime arrow, handle all kinds of stuff. Okay. So, so I'm going to start it with JSON. So I finally talked about what JSON really is. This is my formal introduction. So it's a representation of object. I mean, the name is called, you know, um, uh, JSON stands for JavaScript uh, Object Notation. So it's representing a object. So it, in fact, it's representing all kinds of perspective, it's representing the action, which is member function, it representing a, uh, the data and its content. So essentially, JSON is a really nice format for you to capture the, um, a, a current state of an object that you're interested, regardless which programming language you're using. If you're using C++, Java, and, uh, or, or Python, or any object in language, I actually can represent as a general format that I can actually do that. So what's JSON looks like? JSON, as I mentioned to you earlier, is what we call key value pair. What you have is essentially a bunch of this kind of key value. Key is definitely a string. The value could be a lot of things. The value could be a string, could be a number. It could be another option. So you, you could have one JSON and concatenate it as another JSON, all right? So, um, and, and the order doesn't matter. It will, it will uh, just reorder everything. Um, so I said uh, the JSON possible value could have either the basic data types such as string, boolean, integer, double, or it could be null. I mean, you will see a lot of uh, uh, data. It doesn't have anything and I say null. And then it has array. 
and it has object. So array, the format of array is somewhat different. Is that array, you have to use the bracket. So essentially when I declare as an array, is that I still have a key. I still have a key, key value. The value means array. So I have a key and then I have an array. Array is represented with this bracket. And then inside the array, I have a multiple element. I have a multiple element. So essentially, when you talk about array, then you can index into that. So for example, if this is the array, then when you do JSON programming, you can actually index this. This is, this is item number one, this is item number two, and so on and so on. You can actually index that just like when you're writing program is array. So for example, um, JSON is used by most of the social media companies uh, in representing our uh, online uh, discussion. So, so typically that um, uh, when you have, when I say I have lots of uh, uh, comments or lots of reaction, and for example, a particular post has 2 million reaction, then how do I actually represent that information? It's essentially a array. So what you will see if you, I hope I can show you some real Facebook data. Um, maybe I can pull it out uh, in the middle of the class. It's essentially you have say that name array place, I would just replace as comments. Assuming you have lots of comments, I would say that's a comments. And then you can see that comments contain two objects. One object, first one is the data, which data is an array. Basically you have a 2 million, um, uh, comments, then each of the color pair of curly bracket, they represent one comment object. And then this is the array of object. And then usually this is just coding convention. This is not restricted by JSON, but we typically, if you look at the industry, how they use JSON, they have a cap to represent how many elements in the data array. So let me just show you, JSON itself does not give you the number of elements in the, in the array. You have to go through it to find out. And JSON CPP library will actually automatically find that out for you as they parse the JSON. But convention, if you want to do something and check, you might want to add an index there. That's, that's, that's our choice. <clears throat> Okay, so let me give you an example about a JSON. And this is a typical example is describing a person's record. This is almost like a, a person object, but now I'm actually having this uh, 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 a more realistic example about a person's profile information in their captain. So you can see that a person has a first name, last name, that's both first name. Everything in green is the key. Everything in red is the value. Okay, so the, the first uh, key is first name, last name, uh, the status, age, things like that, blah, blah, blah. So you can actually represent a, a nice uh, uh, JSON about that particular person object uh, in the uh, JSON format. And uh, um, yeah, and then this person is interesting. I, I can have a array without anything if this person uh, doesn't have any children or uh, he or she is currently single, then the, the spouse is newer. For example, you can use those kind of value, newer and uh, array. Okay, so typically, I just want to tell you that why JSON is so interesting. Um, when you interact with the um, internet service, which you are doing that every day, there's a concept called front-end server and the back-end server. If you go to a typical company, when you visit their website, uh, like a Yelp or, or whatever service you want to leave some information, we're interacting using HTTP, a protocol, to communicate with, uh, with the, what we call front-end web server. Cyrus is considered a front-end web server when you access to that. Uh, whatever SS server you have with Canvas, that's actually also a front-end server. So front-end server is supporting HTTPD. The HTTP daemon is pretty much like your homework assignment number three server, that that front-end server is receiving all the response about what you want to do. 
So if you look at uh, any of this, either way you go to the web browser and say, looking at the source, you will realize there are two different formats they're using in that uh, web content. So, I mean, you look at the beautiful web page, but really, let me see if I can see anything from here. Just a very quick check. For that matter, I'm going to use Chrome. Let's go to pick a website, Canvas. Let's go to Canvas. Uh, <clears throat> You want me to log in? Oh. You know, I'm not going to log in. I just want to show you how you can look at the text. Uh, wait a minute, am I in? Okay, so if you go to a typical server, a typical browser, Chrome, and then you can go to view, and then there's developer, and then you can say you view source. Okay, and, and then you're going to see things like this. So this, when you look at this, is essentially XML. But if you look carefully, maybe not this website because they usually have more content when they start to use uh, 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 JSON. So actually I want to recommend when you go home, when you use Facebook on a browser like uh, Chrome, go to developer source. And you look at that, the first part is going to be XML. But when they get to the content, the second part is probably more than the first part. It's all JSON. You will see a huge JSON over there by using uh, the source code. This is uh, essentially the information is being connecting all the web together. There's XML and JSON. But, what I want to tell you is this. Now I'm going to come back here. <clears throat> so essentially what we look at is the XML and JSON is helping us from the client connecting to the front end web server. But the reality is after it passed front end server, you need to access the secondary server deep in their network. Because this is just a front end portal. The real information processing is actually after that. It's like your homework assignment number three, that you have a first level shadow, but from the first level shadow, it's actually referred to the second level shadow. That's why I want you to implement something with one client and two servers, at least that. Because then you can realize that that's actually the real situation in the internet. So what's interesting, I want to bring this up to you, is that after you pass that portal, the first hop, in most cases, the XML part is gone, only JSON live at that point because the XML part is handling the web HTTP related portion of that information exchange. But after that, everything only JSON is needed. So you, you, you probably then realize that why learning JSON is so important because it actually show you everywhere. Okay, this is just to motivate you what's going to happen. Oh, I have some example, great. So this is a web page that I think I post something. Uh, um, oh, this is ETF 36P spring 2020. Um, more than one years ago, when I post this on the internet to when, when we have an internet outage. By the way, internet outage is, is not uh, happening uh, today. It's already happening all the time. I, I post this, tell students 
that's okay. I, I need to switch my internet service provider. When I did that, then I do a, um, I did a um, web service uh, of the source code. I actually got to see something like this, but you can see that uh, this is actually a converted. I convert that JSON into the, the, the JSON that our class can use. So now you see I'm the BSID. But this is a JSON essentially exactly mimic the same structure that Facebook is using. So let me actually tell you what this, this part, I'm going to spend the rest of today's class, I have a 12 minutes to actually just help you to understand this particular picture. So what we really have is trying to represent this picture. So this is a picture about a post, which is I original because my, my, uh, um, my avatar name is Oracle. And I basically say, uh, I just got my internet back. So that is a post and I share some link. And then this is a comment from the student. And of course, you know, the, the first question student asked is the question like what Peter asked at that time. Okay, that's, that's totally understandable. I like extension too, by the way, all right. Um, and, uh, um, and, and basically that, that, that's, that's kind of com conversation. And then we have some kind of reaction and people can actually post it there, okay? So you, you can see that from here, this is called from here. The from here people just see uh, what people exchange idea, people react to each other, comment. You can see that this has already become part of our life. Um, um, in the, in the, so, so, so we have a post over here, by the way, I want to tell you what object we're talking about. We have an object called post. The whole thing is the one single post. And we have an object called comment. And we have an object called reaction. So we already have like three or four different kind of objects over here. And how do I actually represent this in JSON? Okay, I have this. As a JSON, you probably cannot see it. So I'm going back to using this one to explain. So this is a JSON. This is exactly the JSON. I'm going to ask you to um, process for homework assignment number four, homework assignment number five. Okay. So let's actually go through this line by line. Let's actually first look at the first part. The first part is here. Let's look at this part. It's the, um, if you see in the middle, this part is the, is the ID, basically I posted. This has an ID, has a from, who is the from Oracle with what's my VSID. Uh, I hope later you will use your VSID to do that. And then I have a few things, which is then it go to my message, which just got my internet back. And then I have a, a few a link that I share because you remember in the previous picture I actually have some link so I have some link I'm actually going to share but here let's I want to focus on the comments you see that I have a comments here I have a comments as we can see there are wait a minute this one ah sorry there is a link, there is a, there is a page, and then there is a comments by Peter. Let's actually look at how that part is working. So I extract that comment part from here, the whole red into this part. This is the comment. So let's look at how I represent comment in uh, JSON. Uh, it has an ID, that's, that's also the ID has a, oh, by the way, the ID has three parts. I'm actually going to explain later, but you see that that comment has three ID and then it has from avatar name is Peter, BSID, whatever. And the message, this is a key value pair. The key is ID, the key is from, the key is a message. And the value is Professor Wu, can I get an extension through because I'm an AT&T customer. And it has a timestamp, create a timestamp and then has a reaction. And the reaction itself is a array. And it started with data with the first one, avatar, Peter say, he loved the comment, he loved his, his own comment. But then Oracle, the professor reply, 
that his comment is actually angry about that. Okay, so you can see that I'm actually showing you one picture about what you see uh, social media, but the other picture is well, how do you actually represent that using JSON uh, this way? Um, any question about? I'm just showing this segment is representing this particular message, this particular comment. Sorry, this is the post and this particular comment. Any, any questions? Yeah. Okay, so I'm using the SID, but when you use Facebook, you have Facebook actually assign you a free client. Yeah, so if you, that, that's why I actually removed that, I used this, because the original file will have everybody uh, Facebook ID. So essentially, Facebook did a lot of improvement about protecting people's privacy, but still, your Facebook ID is being tracked. So if you, I'm just give you an example, this getting into a little bit about ECS 188 uh, style, is that if you think about your UC Davis student and you support a particular uh, presidential candidate on campus, and and you click live or you click angry, um, say Fox News or, or uh, 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 Occupy, which represents the left and the right. And, and the thing is that some of the people, by the way, they already done it. They collect all the data, they profile you as whether you're supporting this side or the other side. And number one, what they did is they actually targeted send you advertisement, false news. And this, this is a scandal called Cambridge Analytica. You should actually watch the movie, Social Dilemma. It's actually talk about uh, the, the, the Cambridge Analytica. It's all about how you can harvest our information about ourselves in some kind of profiling and such that they can actually target it using machine learning and AI to tell you. I mean, if you think about election, um, if you can send something which the, 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 you boost 1% of probability for the candidate you want to support to come out to vote, and then you actually send discouragement to those who you who against you and by one or 2% in a, in United States, I mean, a swing state. If you have a swing state, just about two or 3% is flipped. So that, that's kind of, very, very huge for, for us in 2016 when the Cambridge Analytica scandal come out. I mean, I have my own opinion about um, 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 Cambridge Analytica. That, that's why when I taught uh, ECS uh, 188, I focus a lot on those subjects um, about how technology, maybe not intentional, but could be used by um, certain party to manipulate our society. It's actually a pretty big deal for me, to be honest with you. Okay, so, but, but that's why I use VSID. And by the way, VSID, I think it's an interesting idea because it, um, later, I hope I have time to talk about this, but the, the ID is, is really need to be, need to be have a multiple form. Otherwise, it's too easy for people to collect who you are and then to, um, to, to at least, the very least they can do is uh, just spam you with the information that's actually uh, have their propaganda. Uh, the worst they can do is that they utilize that to be able to scam and selling your information, identity theft, and a lot of other things as well. All right, so that, that's kind of high level. Uh, all right, I want to use the remaining three minutes to just talk about one thing about the ID, because we talk about ID, so I have to tell you that this is how uh, important for you to understand. You can see that um, the first ID, which is, okay, I have a two level of object. One is called post, one is called comment. Post to comment, comment, sorry, comments to those posts, right? So you have to remember this number that when you look at the first ID, that's the object of a post. What's the 
post ID. Post ID have a two parts, have a two parts. The first portion is what I call page ID. So for example, this page is ECF36D. So the page ID of ECF36B is that first red number, that huge number, 112, whatever. Number, oh, it's blocked. So sorry, I have to do this. Let me use this one and blow it a little bit up. Now you can probably see it. So the first part is what we call the, the red part is actually the, what we call the page ID, which community, which fan page you're talking about. And the second part is what we call post ID. So you have a page ID, you have a post ID. This means that belong to this page, for example, this page is Fox News. Fox News has a page. And Fox News, when they release each of the news article, each of them is a post. And that post has a unique ID as well. So you have a page ID, you have a post ID. So when you go down to comments, the comments, actually, the first two are sharing the same with the post. So this is a comment ID. When you are one of the 400,000 um, commenters, you make a comment on the second Trump and Clinton debate. You make some comment, that's the number the, during the second uh, debate. You will have the first as a page ID, in that case is a Fox News. The second is a post ID, which is represent the, um, that particular uh, post, which is the second debate between those two presidential candidates back then. And the third ID is the common ID. So that's why you have three instead of two. So, so ID is everything. With this ID, you can track pretty much everything. And then with this comment, you can see that now this is the, the person who actually uh, really make that comment. And this is the person who really make that reaction. That's why our, our internet society under social media, it's actually pretty transparent. Basically, everything you did is being recorded. And you can use uh, Facebook API to actually pull it out. And Facebook make a lot of uh, um, improvements such that uh, the API is no longer really, really open by the middle of 2018. But still, um, people still have a way to pull out this information. Let me warn you. And uh, um, if you want to know more questions, I can share with you how that can be done. But uh, in general, it's, it's, it's a danger. I'm just saying that social media, just be careful what you're doing. Okay, so that's why it's ID. So every post has a page ID and a post ID. Every comment, or every reaction has a post ID, has a, um, sorry, page ID, a post ID, and a comment ID as well over there, okay? So that's, that's pretty much, I want to stop here to just give you an idea. Hopefully my purpose today is really just want to motivate you how important um, JSON is today for our information. Yeah. What? Okay, I will, I'll check with DA to make sure that it will update you. Great, all right. All right. So uh, I will stay here if you have any questions. And for the rest of you, have a good weekend. Hmm.